Hello, good morning. Thank you for joining us for this Aussie Rape Establishment Expert Panel. I'm Will Charlton, Arable Marketing Manager at Lee McGrain, and I'll be chairing this morning's session. Uh, before we get going, there's just a couple of uh, very quick points. Firstly, we'd love, love to hear your questions. So if you do have any, please just put them in the question feed. We'll try our best to get through as many in the time we have this morning. Um, uh, the second point is for Basis and Neuroso, we will post a link in that question feed towards the end of the session. If you go through to that link, you'll be able to enter your details to get the, the Basis and Neuroso points for today. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce the panel for this morning. Morning, Colin Peters from NIAB. So at NIAB, we work with a very, very large range of oilseed rate varieties. Um, and we also carry out a lot of management work on all seed rape uh, relating to mainly establishment and as some of you will be aware, quite a lot of cabbage stem flea beetle work as well. Good morning, John Ainsley, farm manager for Skelton Estate in North Yorkshire. I currently manage about 3,800 acres on the edge of the North York Moors, of which 1,800 acres is in arable rotation at the moment. Good morning, I'm Liam Wilkinson. I'm one of the technical specialists here at Limmergrain. Uh, my focus is mainly looking around our oilseed rate portfolio. Um, so this morning I'm going to give a brief presentation looking at the, the genetic traits that we can stack into our varieties now, how these can benefit you on farm, uh, and then we'll go through a question and answer session afterwards. Um, so next slide, please. So I think it's important to realise is that one of the questions that I always get asked is, oh, we can't grow all seed rape like we used to be able to. Um, I think it's important to realise that all seed rape isn't the same crop that it used to be. Um, so going to the next slide, you'll see that we've actually, all seed rape has taken a huge advance. I think actually in terms of crops, I think it's probably seen the most progression out of any um, combinable crop on farms in terms of the technology that we've been able to get into the varieties. So it's only sort of 2006 when the first hybrids were introduced. Uh, and since with the introduction of hybrids, that allows us to stack genetic traits into those. And um, so resistance to FOMA now is, is across most varieties on the recommended list. We've got pod shatter resistance, which is in the mainstay of our portfolio. Uh, resistance to club root, uh, club roots becoming more of a, a more of an issue. Uh, resistance to virus yellows, which is now a, a sort of a staple um, of our portfolio. Every variety we bring through now has TUIV resistance herbicide tolerance and then nitrogen use sufficiency. So the progression we're seeing in all seed rape is absolutely huge. Um, so next slide. So I think this is really important. So as LG, this is sort of our mantra. This is what our breeders are working towards. So obviously yield potential is important. Um, we're looking at resistance to TUIV, resistance to pod shatter, nitrogen use efficiency. I think bringing into that comes disease resistance. I think what you're looking for is how can we utilize every single available unit of nitrogen any any point at, uh, in time where yield is lost is lost nitrogen. So it says NFLEX, I think it's more than that. I think it's about disease resistance, it's about stem health. Um, and with genetic traits, often what you see when they first come onto the list is that there is a yield lag. Uh, when we first brought Amelie onto the list, there was a huge yield lag with that, the TUIV resistance. Look at the recommended list now, all of the varieties have that TUIV resistance. So next slide, please. So looking at the recommended list, it's we're in a very, very strong position. Um, eight, nine of the top 10 varieties are Limmergrain portfolio. Um, and the UK recommended list, I think it's important to know that as growers, that list is relatively useless. Um, that doesn't mean anything to you as a grower. Uh, I think what you need to be looking at is the regional slides. What the UK's recommended list shows you is that variety meets criteria for each specific region. So there's two different specific categories. So two different weightings of agronomics. Uh, for the north and the east regions for a variety to get UK recommendation is quite an accolade because it means that it's got the sort of versatility to be situated across the UK and meets a wide range of agronomic needs. So if we look at the east west list on the next slide you can see that again we're very strong in there Auckland and uh, Adonis are up there for our cells but actually the mainstay are really ambassador a veer on those varieties have stayed around for for a couple of years now and then in the north as well on the next slide we're very strong so we're really we're still the highest yielding variety in the north like lee spot seems to have a great strength of ours in the portfolio and i think that's where that comes into the yield in, with those yields in the north so on to the next slide so i think what the genetics bring is that 
actually what we're looking at now is how can genetics help you on farm? I think I'm currently doing my basis at the moment. The foundation of everything, the first question you get asked is cultural controls and genetics and our varieties can help with this the solution or is a starting point for a lot of these uh, problems on farm. So if we come to the next slide. So during this presentation, I started in agriculture 10 years ago and I've mainly worked through research and trials. Um, so when people say I can't grow all seed rape like I used to be able to, I wasn't really that sure how people used to grow all seed rape. So I found this book in the uh, in the cupboard. Uh, so it's from 1989, which is three years before I was born uh, <laughs> to make people feel better. Um, but I think it gives you a real good insight in actually where we've progressed as an industry, where the research has gone, not just from us as breeders, but actually the likes of NIAB on farm and where we've moved on from. So if we go to the next slide. Um, and just click again. And again. There we go. So this is the list from 1989 about the insecticides that were able to be used in uh, oil seed rape. Um, metaldehyde has gone off that list now um, as of March and deltamethrin has gone as well. But actually what we're looking at is cabbage flea bit as a major problem. Aphids which transmit TUIV are a big problem. We're out of chemical solutions now to control these to control these pests. Genetics is at the forefront of this. So we've gone to the next slide. So TYV genetics is, is a big part of our portfolio. So it's a virus transmitted by Mises persicae, uh, peach potato aphid, uh, with infection in the autumn and the spring. Um, and the symptoms aren't normally seen until the spring, and it's often misdiagnosed as stressor deficiency. So all seed rape has a horrible habit of going purple at the first sign of anything, whether it's manganese, whether it's nitrogen, whether it's wet, whether it's cold, it often goes purple. Unfortunately, that's also a symptom for TYV, and it often goes misdiagnosed. So I think the best way to describe TYV is a little bit, it's almost a little bit like long COVID in the fact that the plant can function, it's just not functioning at full capacity. So it's constantly fighting something in the background, meaning that you're never going to get those high yields. Uh, next slide, please. So there's a lot of talk at the minute about resistances and tolerance. Um, so this is a TYV resistance. So what that means is that the virus stops with the plant, it prevents the multiplication and the spread of the virus through the plants. Any aphids feeding them from that plant from that point onwards um, will not pick up the virus and transmit it. And it's first introduced from stubble turnips using conventional crossing. Uh, and we were the first breeders to make that commercially available in the UK in the variety Amelie. Uh, and now it's so ingrained in our germ, elite germplasm that actually it's, um, it's in all our conventional and hybrid material coming forwards. Considering that the widespread resistance to insecticides in Mises, actually I think a lot of growers now are looking at, at TYV as the foundation of that. So next slide please. So as breeders, um, it's important that we monitor our genetics, uh, we monitor the spread of TYV. Um, so what we do is, this is across Europe, so this is, we've got Ireland in there as well, we've also got the European map in. In Europe this is endemic, they're looking at 80-90% of 80-90% infection every single year, uh, which is why they've probably seen the bulk of their varieties move into hybrids with the TUIV resistance. But in the UK, um, we're seeing high levels now, particularly in the West, which you'd expect with the um, with aphid pressure. But actually, what we're seeing now is it's moving more up that eastern seaboard. So, I would expect this year we'll probably see a higher pressure aphid year. Uh, the sugar beet threshold has been triggered for Mises, so we know there are aphids out there. That if you go into sugar beet crops, you will find aphids, they're there. There's not going to be a frost now between now and drilling to, to knock that back. So I would th say that if you're looking at variety selection for this coming autumn, I think TUIV has to be very strongly uh, in mind. Next slide, please. So cabbage stem flea beetle resistance. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and say that we've got the answer because we haven't. I would love to. Um, but I think what we've learned as breeders is we've we, we've developed more vigorous varieties. Um, we've learned more about crop husbandry through work with NIAB, ADAS. I think what we're doing now, if you look at this picture on there from the book from the 80s, um, they were sowing oilseed rape at eight to nine kilos a hectare. If you want to place that order with me, I'll take it. Um, <laughs> but actually, that's not the way to go. All the research we've seen is that the thicker the crop, the more cabbage stem flea beetle larvae you have. So I think vigour is very important in a variety. Um, but it's how you use that vigour that's important. And I think with vigour, what you're looking for is it gives you a wider sowing window to drill into the right conditions. It's not a get out of jail free card. It's not going to let you survive drilling into a seabed. 
but what it does is it gives you the confidence to say I'm not going to drill by calendar date. There's rain on the there's rain on the forecast in a week's time. I've got confidence that that variety has the bigger to be sown a week later and get up and away from any pest or problems. Also, rape, if you put it on kitchen paper, it will shit overnight in your kitchen windowsill. So establishing all seed rape isn't so much the problem, it's keeping them there. The importance is, is once it's established, is to keep it growing. Um, next slide, please. So what we've done is we have a huge portfolio, as you see from the recommended list earlier. I think I currently look after 17 varieties um, sold across the UK. Um, so what that's given us does, it's given us a really good um, platform to pull these varieties apart, which I don't think other breeders have had that opportunity to do before. And what that allows us to do is look at, we know all varieties established, but it, and we know all varieties get to that end goal, um, but it lets us look at how varieties reach that end goal. And knowing that's really important in terms of crop husbandry, in terms of which varieties need to be sown earlier, which varieties can you afford to sow later, um, which varieties might need a PGR in the autumn. Um, so that's given us a really good target. From work that we've done in France um, through Terra Novia, we know that the goal for sort of trying to survive flea beetle is getting to that eight leaf stage, eight, uh, eight millimetres of collar and 15 centimetres main root as quickly as possible. If you get to that point, you've got the big best possible chance of surviving larval damage. So next slide, please. So the key is to reach three to four leaves. So this is the main point that where adult flea beetle damage is, is the most prevalent. Then we reach winter biomasses again, those eight weeks. Um, and as I said before, knowing how these varieties get to that point affects sowing dates and agronomic practice. Long gone are the days, I think, of all rape just being chucked in the ground and forgotten about. Certain varieties now require different management strategies. Um, and I think it's really important. It's a high value crop. We need to get the most out of it. Next slide, please. So this is just an example, this is LG Aviron, which is one of our more vigorous varieties. As you can see, when it starts settling off, it does keep growing. So LG Aviron, if drilled early, you will need to be using sort of a metconazole or a, a PGR product or a product with growth regulatory effect in the autumn, just to check that canopy if it's drilled to autumn and is actively growing, um, compared to something like Aspire, which is a lot slower to reach that end goal. It will reach that end goal point, for flea beetle top, being able to withstand flea beetle, it just takes slightly longer to get there. So next slide, please. So I think stem health, uh, this is something that we've talked about a lot this year, but I think it's really important is that stems often go unnoticed and stem health goes a lot unnoticed in oilseed rape. Obviously people know verticillium, people know sclerotinia, um, but FOMA like Lee Spot, I think FOMA actually is an industry not just ourselves as breeders, I think all breeders now have got a pretty good handle on FOMA. We've got RLM7 genes, we've got multiple RLM genes as um, other breeders bringing in other diverse genetics, which is really good for the industry. And I think that's seen in crops. There's not actually a lot of FOMA. I didn't see a lot of FOMA when I was out there this year. Uh, it's more problematic in the West, but actually I think the levels compared this year. Verticillium, very sporadic. You need very specific weather conditions at times of the year to actually trigger verticillium. So for us to target our breeding program solely on verticillium would be very naive in effect. And the same with sclerotinia. Sclerotinia, the best method for controlling sclerotinia is normally to put four canes up in a field and do a trial because you never get it. Um, but sclerotinia is of importance, but the chem controls are still there. I think where we're seeing the biggest change in now is like leaf spot. Um, it used to be the Scottish disease. I think one of our German breeders used to sort of question why we targeted like leaf spot for such a small market. If you go on to the next slide, please. You should see that like leaf spot is becoming more of an issue. With the mild autumns, we're now seeing that this polycyclical stage of the disease is becoming more prevalent. So obviously everyone knows that you get the foliar symptoms. You then get the stem symptoms as well. And, and they're the ones that can cause a lot of damage in, in droughty stressed harvests because the plant shuts off a lot quicker. Um, so next slide, please. So what we're doing with this is that we're actually seeing different resistances to the stem based symptoms of light leaf spot compared to the foliar symptoms of light leaf spot. So if you look at the slide, you can see that we have a really an ambassador. So on that's on the X on the Y axis, you can see the severity. So the lower that's the red bar is, the better the variety. Um, and then we've got the RL scores on there as well. So actually you can see that a really an ambassador score sevens, the comparator hybrid on the end with the cost score of seven as well for light leaf spot. They are vastly different stem based scores. Uh, and even from ourselves, you can see that LG Aviron in there, that's now the only eight rated light leaf spot variety on the list. 
actually that's we've seen that Aurelia has the cleaner stem. So we are seeing discrepancies in this. Um, and that's where our breeding target is. It's not just focusing on foma, it's not just focusing on like these spot. It's an all round approach to stem health uh, and how we can get the best out of these rice and take them to the full yield potential at the end of the harvest. So next slide, please. So that's just a, a visual. So ambassador compared to a, a comparator. So this is from our screening site in Scotland where we've got about 7,000 mini plots up there screening for, for disease. Um, so you can see there that the, the light leaf spot symptoms on those stems are quite severe. In the UK, not so much of an issue in a normal growing season, but actually when you start getting droughty harvests or quick end to the season, that stops the transmission, the transportation of nutrients up into the top canopy, reducing your oils, reducing your yield and weakening stems as well. So next slide, please. I think pod chatter, this is one that I've been talking about a lot this year, and I think actually is one of the most important traits that we have in our varieties. I think if you look at it, it was first introduced as an agronomic feature on the recommended list last year. Orchid rape, and that's the reason we're here, is in a, a sort of a panel discussion on how to grow orchid rape. Also, your rape can be a headache to grow. I don't think there's anyone here who's going to disagree with that. To get it to harvest and then all your seeds shatter out as soon as you get a high wind is heartbreaking. <laughs> and it's a weight and it's a, it's a massive financial loss this year as well with the price as it is. To have genetic security in your variety against pod shattering to me is, is a no brainer. I think actually what that does is it gives you just that final level of security. At the point where pod shattering is event is impact, you have made your maximum spend on oil seed rape. There's nothing left to put into it. You've spent all your fertilizer, all your fungicides, all your diesel has been into that crop. This is the last line of defense. And I think as a free insurance with the, as a genetic, I think it's a, it's a no brainer for me. So go to the next slide. So pod shatter is a natural process. Um, I think that's really important to remember is that that crop's natural aim is to spread seed as far as it can. It wants to shatter. That's how plants survive in the wild. Um, so pod shatter resistance is something that we've introduced with radish along with the restorer gene. And what that does is it protects, protects against untimely pod shatter in commercial crops, resulting in seed losses. So the pod shatter resistance, what that does is it strengthens the bonds on the on the mesocarp of the um, of the pod. So those bonds become a lot stronger. And when you get constant wetting and drying at harvest, if you get a catchy harvest, those pods contract and shrink, making them brittle. Those bonds are stronger in those varieties, meaning that they're, they're more resilient to the effect. So the picture you can see there, uh, both those varieties were sprayed with, with pod stick, uh, looking at the video that Russ put on. But actually, you can see the pod shattered variety on the right is still there, whereas the, there's the um, white crop on the left. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the aim of pod shot is to reduce harvest losses. Hailstorms, adverse weather. I spoke to a lot of growers last year who we had some mega hailstorms around here last harvest. Um, they're not going to protect you against some of those that we saw, but actually they'll protect you against the bulk of it. It's, a, it's another line of defence. Security around delayed harvest. We've seen a lot more catchy harvests now. Resilient to wet and drying and obviously reduces volunteers in the following crops. So next slide, please. So these were sent over last year. These are from our colleagues in the Ukraine. Um, the big problem for them is pod shatter because obviously they have massive fields. Um, so timing is everything really in terms of their workload. You can see there the, the difference between the pod non-pod shatter and the pod shatter varieties is, is really is night and day. Um, next slide, please. So I think the easiest way when I've been talking to some of the, the guys is that I think we probably have too many varieties on that, not us as breeders, I'm quite happy with how many varieties we've got on there. Um, but the recommended list have a lot of varieties. There's no getting around that. And I think that's confusing for growers. I think if you want to look at pod shatter as an important trait, if you go on to the next slide, that cuts the list right down. So if you're looking at that first line of defence, you've got pod shatter up there as the key, uh, key trait really. Uh, next slide, please. And that's that's it. So we'll go to the panel discussion now, I think. Liam, thank you very much. OK, so um, we've got several questions through already from our panel. Um, uh, I think we'll probably start from the top. So we've got a question here. Um, uh, what should we do to this year's Aussie rape stubbles to aid cabbage stem flea beetle control after harvest? or at drilling. 
um, for this coming crop. I mean, Colin, I know you've done quite a lot of work on flea beetles, so I was wondering if you've got any thoughts from the research you've done so far. Um, <clears throat> yes, so at the moment, um, we've been, <coughs> excuse me, we've been leaving all seed rape stubbles to regenerate uh, in the hope that we can actually encourage adult flea beetles to, to stay there. Um, one of the things we have learnt over the last 12 months, we, we, we're now just over a year into this project, and one of the things we have learnt is that there's a possibility that the, the knowledge we have of the life cycle of this pest isn't the same as what we think it was. A lot of the work was done in the 1980s, and it looks like things have evolved. So one of the big things we're now trying to do is to understand the life cycle. Um, to start the ball rolling last year, we set emergence traps into oilseed rape stubble so we could actually find out exactly when they're starting to emerge. And in some areas in the middle of the country, we picked up an emergence a lot later than we would have expected. Um, so this was going into October and we were picking up two million adults a hectare equivalent. Um, so that points us to the fact that the, if that's real and happens con in consecutive years, the, the adults are emerging from the ground when the rape plants are, are too big to be of interest. So we are looking at doing, in, uh, we're going to be doing a big chunk of work this year on looking at how to actually manage the volunteers or can we actually put trap crops in later and, and monitor how the adults actually behave. This is So this is to do with the, the stem larval. So can we actually get the egg laying to go on to different plants at different stages later? Because that, that's not happening in the volunteers at the moment. So jury's out, but we are looking hard at volunteers because we think there's a huge potential either in the volunteers or using a similar nurse crop somewhere else to actually influence the, the adult numbers. But as far as our belief as a trap crop to aid establishment, we're not finding a benefit. Brilliant, thanks Colin. Anyone, any other thoughts? I mean, John, how do you establish your um, your Aussie rape? Well, we've done it both ways with mint till and direct drilling. Um, and both work, I would say the mint till is probably more consistent and we try to get the rape in, in from well, as soon as the winter barley comes off, really. Um, as far as leaving the Odyssey rape stubble, because we like to start drilling wheat quite early, it's we leave the volunteers in. That aids, it, it aids the, the soil structure as well. But actually, once we put the main till through, they're gone, mm -hmm. really. Uh, if, we're, if we're direct drilling, then obviously there's going to be some left. But it's, it's, um, yeah, it's something to think about if that's going to aid uh, um, control in the future. Yeah, brilliant. Um, we've got another one kind of linked to that, perhaps. Um, asking for our views on companion crops for the establishment of all seed rape. I mean, Liam, I know you've done a bit of work on that um, here. Have you got any any thoughts on companion crops? In terms of companion crops, I think I think the jury's still out. I think it's the same when any do any when you look at any small plot work, you're looking at a choice trial, and it's slightly controversial, but if you've got a flea beetle and they've got an easy option or a difficult option, they're going to go for the easy option and they'll do that in small plot work. The question comes, we've seen that with slugs, we see that with pigeons, that they prefer one variety to another. As soon as you put a field of the, the variety out or a companion crop, they've got nothing else to go for. They will go for the more difficult option because they they have to survive. I think all seed rape, if you're struggling to establish all seed rape, I wouldn't consider that putting a competitor with it will have that much benefit. Um, in terms of trying to raid the crop. If you can establish your rate and keep it growing, as soon as we can get it to those key growth stages, three to four leaves for adult and that eight leaf or an eight mil collar for, for larval more tolerance, I think that's the key. I think with companion cropping, what people probably should be looking at is the following crop and the benefit it has to the following crop, not the current crop. Um, what we've looked at with companion cropping is if people are looking for a companion crop as sort of a sacrificial crop or something to trap in. I know a couple of guys who are looking at mixing conventionals with hybrids. If you're looking to do that, then actually you've got a companion crop, which is herbicide safe. You drill it the same way, you put it in the same drill. And actually, if it survives, you can yield it. 
Um, so that's something that some guys are looking at. So putting a slower developing conventional variety with a fast developing hybrid. So the conventional will sort of attract that as the hybrid grows more quickly away. And I think you've done some work on that as well. Haven't you? We have yet. I mean, we're, we're playing around with foil seed rape as the companion crop, um, as, as are quite a few people. And again, the jury's out. This is this is new stuff we're trying. We've we've not had a lot of success in proving that putting a different crop in helps with establishment. Um, and what we have just done, uh, for some of you will have partaken in, we've done a big stem larval count from hundreds and hundreds of samples sent from all over the country. Um, some of those had, uh, a lot of those had companion crops. None of it made any difference to the stem larval numbers other than a couple of small places where people had drilled into a very established cover crop and that companion crop was still covering the all seed rate basically up at Christmas. So that's a slightly different world and that'd be interesting to see how that one yields. But other than that, we haven't seen any difference in stem larval numbers, no matter what you plant with it. Interesting, thank you. Um, moving on to a slightly different subject, I've got a question here. Is club root an increasing problem and should growers be doing more soil testing to determine the problem? I mean, perhaps to kick us off, I know, John, you've you've got some club root yeah. on your farm. Might yeah. be good just illustrating kind of where, where you are with it and how you manage it. Goodness. Yes, we do have a club root problem. <laughs> um, and, you know, when we first started growing our seed root many, many years ago, we were told not to grow it much closer than five or six years. And of course, We've all got a bit greedy with that down to two, three years, and I think we're, we're suffering from that now. We're out, we've moved it back out to five years on a rotation. We're doing the soil sampling, etc. And we're, we're oh, I mean, you've got your pH, which is obviously important. You've got to get that right and everything else. But I think it goes deeper than that as well. We've got high magnesium soils, and what we're finding is to improve those soils, that relationship between the magnesium and the calcium is is, is crucial, really. Yeah. And that, if you get when you get that right or you correct it, you get a lot more tilth in your soil. So we're looking to see just quite how that works within the soil sampling as well that we've done and continue to do. But yeah, club root is a, a big concern. We've tried quite a few club root resistant, well, a few club root resistant varieties, and we've actually got some anarian in this time, and that. In, in what would be a club root nasty feel for want of a better expression that you can hardly see any at all and you've got a lovely long tap root in there so that's really clicking in this year yeah. which is good mm. yeah I think you, you, you wouldn't have actually given that crop or that field much time in January if you'd looked at it there was bits of knobbly in the other fields there was bits of club root there were yeah. big knobbly things coming out on the top and that sort of thing whereas this field has been clean as a whistle mm. Yeah, and it was direct drilled. I think I think as breeders now, what we're seeing is is that we're managing to bring those traits that we're stacking into conventional hybrids. <laughs> no, into the hybrid. So we're seeing the R M seven. We're seeing the the club root resistance, T U I V pod shatter. We're now bringing those in, into those club root varieties, and actually the yield gap is getting is getting closer. I think the issue for me would be is that. <clears throat> all these club root varieties are based on one one gene from Mendel. I think it's going forward, it's going to be how do we look after this gene? I know there are there was work going on looking for other club root resistance genes, but obviously if they find it, it's still going to be ten years before they can get that into a con into a breeding program. So I don't know if you've got any opinions, Colin, but actually with looking at growing non club root varieties in or growing club root risk varieties in non-club root situations, I think it's going to be a challenge to stop people in the future. I 100% agree. Um, we've got to protect that limited um, genetics that we have got available. Um, <clears throat> so part of the question was, should we do more testing? Yes, basically. You need to understand the risks in your own farms, and we also need to, like a lot of things these days, and, and flea beetles are part of this as well, we need to go back a bit in time and think more about crop husbandry and understanding what we're trying to do. So widening the rotation, much as much as we want to grow all seed rate, we can't just pile it on and pile it on like we have because we've we've caused this problem ourselves and we need to actually manage it as much as protect the genetics that we've got. 
I think that was key actually is the, is the crop husbandry. I think I think without a shadow of a doubt it is. It's about rotation and how you stretch that rotation. It's all you know, we've all got to make a profit. So it, yeah. Those crops that's in that rotation have to be profitable, but they have to be. It's not just a case of looking at one crop, the whole lot forms forms you, 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 you've got to look at it as a round and all the crops form that bottom line margin that you're going to make not just one of them no. and for us for example the only reason we grow winter barley really is, to, is an early entry into rape because i can't find anything else that's better than that yeah um, and certainly leaving it fallow or anything like that doesn't work no. uh, from when set aside first came in so it, it you were always looking at different ways to try and um, enhance that bottom line margin for the rotation as a whole. Yeah, and I think also rape is, I think gone are the days when it was put in with a subsoil and then forgotten about, which is what well, which is it, what used to happen. It's a high value yeah, crop. But now. it's a high value crop. You've got a lot of money laid out between drilling and Christmas, say, and that's yeah. before you get to sticking the high price now <laughs> in the in in sort of March and April. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's also part of a it's it's a big chunk of rotations. You know, it's, it's not right. just an independent crop on its own, but the testing for club root is simple. So we ought to be doing a lot more of it so that we do actually understand what's going on in our own fields in the same way you do P and K. Yeah. I think speaking to people who have got club root problems, I think they normally realise they've got a club root problem before they ask you, <laughs> before yeah, they do any yeah. testing, because you look at the cover crop mixtures are out there now, there's a lot of grasses in cover crop mixtures. And birds in. And you look and you go to Scotland and some girls say, oh, I've got club root, oh, what's your rotation? Oh, I grow, grow one in five, but they forget about the the that the, or the, you know, the brassicas that they've got in that rotation. Yeah. It's not it, just... It, 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 it is difficult rate. just hitting a balance because equally you don't want to grow pulses too close together either. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Um, just going back to establishment, we've got a question from Andrew and another one um, uh, linked uh, from Henry here. So Andrew asked what the panel's thoughts are on row spacings, um, potentially around um, as part of that around um, cabbage stone flea beetle as well. And linked to that, Henry's um, establishing his crop this year with a, a DTX cultivator and an air broadcast seeder on the back. So um, probably linked to that in terms of spacings and that that setup in particular. Um, is there any thoughts on on how to manage wider row spacings, smaller row spacings, and um, potentially the impact on on flea beetle and establishment. We we've not seen any benefit <clears throat> of being wide or thin to do with with the management of flea beetle. Um, we all know you can actually go quite wide with all seed rape, and the canopy will fill in quite quick. Um, but certainly from a flea beetle point of view, we we've not seen any benefit. Um, I don't know whether you can comment on the drill set up there. Well. We've tried different row spacings. I mean, if we're going min till, we have a, a horse plant row, so that goes at about six inches seed spacing. We've had a different drills out in the past, up to 20 inch wide rows, uh, and that works. It, it's good. It looks a bit different the first time you do it, but it, it, it works. But I think we're coming back to it's basically how many plants per square meter you're yeah. putting in. Mm -hmm. And you can probably go, I mean, it's a few years ago now we had a I think it was 2012 or 30, I can't remember, where it, what, it was looking poor. And um, we're down to about eight or nine plants per square metre in places. And as long as you looked after it and managed it, you still got a viable crop out of that at the end of the day. Yeah, you I, know? I think also right loves room. Yeah, it does. And, and it's, if you crowd it, what, yeah. all you end up with is a really thin, top, heavy band right. of pods within yeah. sort of the top. Right. I mean, if, from a growers point of view, it's always lovely to see a nice, big lush crop because it gives you peace of mind that you think god we're beating the slugs we're beating the flea yes. beetle we're off and running again but sometimes that's yeah. counterproductive really yeah i think if you can get branching from the bottom if, that, yeah. if those crops that look yeah. nice but then you crouch down and you can see the other yeah. end of the field from it no, through the stems right. they're not the ones that yield it's the ones that yield right from the bottom that's right i've seen fields that we had with um, with tim and they were yielding sort of six ton with in places there was two three plants per square meter yeah. but the plants were like with the like branches they were they're very very thick yeah when you get them right it's but it is it's very easy just to edge that middling yeah. mechanism up on the drill and think oh i've got to put a bit in for the flea beat and a bit <laughs> in for the slugs and it's 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 we shouldn't no. well we shouldn't because of the price of it as well <laughs> <laughs> um 
Um, any thoughts on placement fertilizer, Trina? Uh, um, question for Brian here. Um, straight N, P or K or DAP rates. I mean, do you do, you do put? Um, well, actually, we're just you'll hold a new drill, and that'll come with the ability to place fertilizer. Yeah. Uh, solid down there. We have had um, a contractor in putting rape in where he placed liquid nitrogen in, and that seems to work as well. Mm. But I think this is. It, it, it all works. It's just how it fits into your system when you're buying the kit. Because don't forget, this stuff is is quite a lot of money. Yeah. So you can't just sort of go change stuff every year or every other year. Um, at least we can't anyway. Yeah. Yeah. But yes, it works. Yeah, it saves money. It's a great way to get that DAP down the spout and at a very much reduced rate of targeted. I think. Mm -hmm. We would certainly mirror that DAP down the spout is the perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, um, not everyone's got the ability to do that. And then, then a lot of it comes down to weather conditions and, and what you're able to actually do. Well, it does, but if you're direct drilling as well, as opposed to the main tilling bit, what we're finding is because you're not moving the soil, you're not getting that soil mineralisation, that bit of nitrogen in the DAP, regardless of what the Environment Agency says or what the rules are going to be, does help that direct drill yeah. crop. There's no question about that. And, you know, when, and I know you're saying that rape, the way we grow it's changed dramatically since when we first started growing yeah. way back when. But the standard dress in them was was a 300 rate of triple 17 yeah. into the seedbed to get those crops away. Yeah. So some of this, some of this, some of the husbandry methods haven't varied a heck of a lot. No. You know, some have, but not all of them. I think I saw a field last year and it was drilled with DAP and one of the spouts got blocked, and I thought that. Not, there was the crop yeah. difference was huge. Right. I thought there'd been a, a block C cut. Yeah. It wasn't. It was yeah. just the DAP. I mean, that technology's moved on. There's loads of machines and there's loads of lads and, and girls doing different things out there. That that's really in different farm groups and that sort of thing. And and once you speak to them, you're finding out just mm -hmm. quite how good some of these things are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think anything you can do to aid that seed and get it up and going. I think that's the keys. Moisture is obviously key, but then you've got fertiliser as well. If he's got moisture and nutrients, that rape will grow regardless of what he's attacking it almost. Yeah, I think I think going forward, just with well, the cost of fertiliser, the environment and everything else, a lot of these inputs, we've got to try and work on targeting them better. Yeah. If you, if you go back before Liam was born, um, <laughs> you're quite right. You say things, things like Triple Seventeen used to go on, but he, in those days, it was a classic bag of nitram and acre would yeah, go it was on for a minute. It was through the ground, yeah, yeah. you know, and it's it's so that hasn't changed. But the the placement is giving us a big benefit as well. Yeah. But they're, they're, I totally take what you're saying about the the soil mineralisation. There is a difference between the direct. There is. We, and we, see, we see it in the cereals where we're drilling, uh, when the, whatever we drill. Min till compared to the direct drilling, the the min till stuff always just looks up in green, and it's just it, it has to be just that mineralisation yeah. effect of, of the soil movement. And also, we're paying a lot more for our inputs inputs now as yeah. well. So actually, spending that bit of time to mm -hmm. actually get it where you want it, and don't put it on if the conditions aren't right because you're wasting your money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and a bit of this comes back to the. Gone, gone are the days, hopefully, yeah, the, the people we see establishing rate properly and, and successfully are the ones that keep an eye on what's going on. They don't just wait until all the wheat's been combined, have the weekend off and then go and look for the drill. They're thinking all the time about what they're doing and it will evolve all the time. And as we discussed last night, there is no blueprint. Everyone does it differently. Yeah. And those who are doing it consistently successfully are looking at all the conditions all the time and they're stopping what they're doing to get that rape in yeah. the ground, which is, I believe, is the right thing to do. It is, and that's where your pod shutter comes in, actually, yeah. because certainly where we are, uh, you know, the winter barley comes off and then you're, you're thinking, God, let's get the rape in and your combine's coming to combine, yeah. uh, the rape's coming to combine quickly as well. And what we're doing now is, you know, we're putting pod stick on, we're using these things and we're saying, right, hang on a minute, let's just take a, a breath here. Let's get the barley off, get the rape in, then we'll go and cut the rape. Yeah. You know, and then you're moving on after that. And that might mean a pause for a couple of days, but if you've got that confidence that actually you've got pod shatter and you've got a bit of pod stick on there, yeah. it's it's not going to go far. No, and I, I think as well at the minute, I would still be looking at using pod stick 
Yeah. The price of rape at the minute, I I think you'd be daft. Daft. Not to do. It's 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 an insurance policy. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, uh, We have another question here. Um, What is the most significant genetic innovation in rape for securing final yield potential? I mean, I know you should get a timeline there. I mean, it'd be interesting in anyone's thoughts on, on whether there's one thing in particular or whether it's a combina- combination of things. I think it's a combination, to be honest. And, and I think we're very lucky that firms like Lima Graham and others have got a whole portfolio, you know, gene stacking yeah. is, the, is the expression, but we've got a lot of potential already wrapped up in these little seeds. Um, and I think, uh, be it pod chatter, be it disease resistance or whatever, the TUV thing, it, we, we probably underestimate in our own crops how much we're losing because of that. Um, so I, th- I think it's it's the general, uh, the whole potful. Yeah, I would agree with that. It's very difficult. I mean, if you, if you took a, a greenhouse trial, yeah. the yields would be up there and everything that we don't do or get wrong is just reducing it down to what we get on the farm. Yeah. So it, it, it's... It's the attention to detail and you're never going to get it right all the time. No. But you've got to look at how, what works and what doesn't and how it fits into your particular farm and whether that's in North Yorkshire, Northumberland, the borders or Devon in Cambridgeshire or further south, it's going to be different. Yeah, I think the genetic traits, I think what they are is risk mitigation. Mm-hmm. It's about this is the yield potential. Yeah. So you've got your glasshouse yield. Yeah. All that the genetic traits are doing <clears throat> is helping you get one step closer to realising that yield potential. It, it is. It and is. it's not just one thing. I think the TYV is a big thing. I don't think we actually saw the worst of TYV. TYV came in, resistance came into our varieties as the neonic seed dressings were still here. So I don't think we actually <coughs> saw really how bad TYV could have been because the, the neonic seed treatments would have stopped it coming into crops as badly. Now that the bulk of the varieties, we do testing on the TYB varieties, it's getting quite hard to find them now, to, to find susceptible varieties out there on farm. But it's the combination of all of those genetic traits together that I think are really important. In, and that's what hybrids allow us to do. It allows that gene stacking that you don't get with the conventional. Mm-hmm. I just think it's about risk management on the farm. You, you spend such a lot of money to get crops established and take them through. Uh, and, and you need a, you know, a bigger pot to work from, really. And the more... Um, things that you have that can reduce the risk of things going wrong, both in cereals with disease resistance, yeah. you know, better resistant varieties, that sort of thing, the better it has to be. Yeah, surely. And starting off with the right seed is, it's the easy, it's the easiest option really to pick the variety which mitigates the most risk. Actually, is the easiest option. At the, it's a free, it's not free, but it's the it's the start <laughs> it's the starting block yeah. for a lot of your program. It is, and it's, it's you know, the old saying holds true. The most important day of a seed's life is the day it's drilled. And if you're putting the right seed into the right conditions, you've got a good start. Yeah. I'd even go further than that. The most important yeah. day is the day before it's drilled. Yeah, well, yeah. 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 It's, yeah. It's, it's the thought process that goes into it. Yeah. 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 Um, got um, one here. Um, what are the panel's thoughts on the risk of alternaria? Um, well, then you might be the best equipped um, to answer it, that. If you've yeah, I mean, it, it, it still exists. Um, it, it, it comes down to monitoring a crop, looking at the weather conditions and, and keeping your eye on things, really. You know, we can't, <clears throat> you reach that time of year again, you've spent a lot of money. And, and so, you know, the, the agronomy of the crop, you, there are tools out there still. Um, and it's a case of, of just keeping an eye on things and, and paying attention, really. Mm. Do you think many of the fungicides which go on at flowering for skirting and like you get incidental control of alternate area anyway, so perhaps not, you, even though you may not be targeted to yeah, that as it, a particular... It, it, possibly. I actually do think quite often that too many sprays go on for sclerotinia when the conditions are such that the sclerotinia risk is very, very low. Um, yeah. But... You, will, you, you you probably are getting a little bit of protection from it. But again, after that period, you still need to be looking at the crop on a very regular basis. Just because it started to form pods doesn't mean to say the job's done. Yes, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, uh, we have a question here from John Smith. Um, 
Are there specific varieties in the LG portfolio that you advise for particular drilling dates, i.e. ones that work well very early or later? Um, Liam, I know you've done a fair bit of work, got some thoughts on that. I think I think all varieties, I think it's foolish to say that all varieties, I think that some of the, all varieties will drill early. Let's not get away from that, is that you can plant every variety early. I think it's important for people to realise actually as breeders and even trials, we don't start drilling trials till September. It's farmers who then take those varieties and think, right, I'm going to stick that in in July. Um, you ought to explain why that's the case. Yeah, I mean, yeah. part of that is down to seed, getting seed across the borders mm -hmm. now. Um, but even turnaround from harvest, if we've got the nurseries here, so we're quite lucky at Limograin, our breeding programme is here. But to get seed turnaround from harvest and get that replanted, it, it takes time. You're looking at uh, September drilling anyway. I think certain varieties fit earlier. I think there's so sort of the slower developing varieties such as Aspire, Aurelia doesn't get too ahead of itself, but I think it's the agronomy that goes with those varieties that's important. So a rear one, you can drill a bit on early, but you will need to be looking at going in with a growth regulator at some point um, because that canopy does get very far ahead of itself. Conversely, Aspire probably wouldn't drill it late because it takes a lot longer to get to that final point. So I think when you're looking at varieties, yes, they will drill early. Some varieties are a safer bet to drill early because they don't get too growy by which I mean they don't put too much leaf canopy on, they just sit. Um, so varieties like Aurelia, Antigua, they get to a certain growing point and then they just they sort of shut down for the winter quite early. Ambassador and Aviron keep going a little bit longer, so you need to keep more of an eye on those. So it depends what sort of approach you're taking on farm, whether you want to, again, it's about risk management. If you want the easy, if you want something that you can sow in early and shut the door on, I don't think those varieties exist, but the varieties such as Aurelia, looking more at Antigua, probably Areti a little bit, and Arin if you're looking at Club Brew. As you go later into the drilling window, that's when you need to be looking at more of the vigorous varieties. Location as well. Yeah. I, you know, it, it, yeah. It's, we, one of the first questions was when the phone rings and when, when we get asked question of where do you live? Because obviously in the southwest, it's completely different oh. to the north of Scotland. Um, and again, this comes into everyone. everyone's farm is unique. Um, but the, as Liam mentioned, one of the problems we have, breeders and ourselves, is the fact that we don't get seed early enough to, to plant it in a way that reflects how many growers grow it. And that's something you need to take into consideration when you're looking at the RL list and the like, is the fact that we're through no fault of anyone's um, we don't get to see generally until September and that's because of a lot of work that goes on in Europe uh, then we're now struggling to get the, the seed across uh, because of Brexit so there is there is the element of all the figures you see tend to be done with later drilled varieties. Yeah I think you know location the other thing is you want that crop in the ground you want it away and you want it, you want it up. We have a lot of pigeon damage to contend with and everything. And yes, it works. We drilled right up in the middle of September and had not bad crops, but you wouldn't like to do that every year no. because if you get a, where we are next to the coast, you get those sea frets coming in, it just slows everything down. Yeah. If you get those no, winds coming in off the North Sea, you can just whip the top straight off them, even through into January, February, those smaller plants where what we're finding is just with us anyway, if you get that plant in, you get that th those roots down, it, it will survive uh, poor winters, yeah. wet winters, because on our kind of ground, we don't have the best sort of natural drainage through there. I think if you're looking to drill early, I think you should be looking for good light leaf spot resistance. Mm -hmm. Because obviously if you're drilling early, you've got more disease pressure, but actually light leaf spot, I said earlier, lives on the stem. Right. If you've drilled your crop already, and before you've even harvested your oil seed rape, you're going through with your combine chopping straw. Yeah you're releasing a hell of a lot of light leaf spot spores into, into the environment, which can settle on the crop. I think later on, you're probably looking for better foam resistance because obviously foam is more damaging on smaller crops um, because it gets into the into the PTLs later. So I think disease resistance is a really important one, um, but light leaf spot, I would say, is, is of importance for the early drilling because the canopy is more lush mm -hmm. come winter, foam for later drilling. Yeah, I think you, you mentioned um, moisture there, but good soil management and 
waterlogging is becoming more of a problem. We're yeah. picking up more more comments about uh, road crops struggling. And so um, as we move into wetter winters, which is what we seem to be getting, um, and, and then we seem to be missing spring out and going straight into summer these days. Um, but don't underestimate the, the damage that compacted soils will cause to rape. They really don't yeah. like it. But this, I mean, rape is, a, rape is, you know, that will test your soils out because it doesn't like poor soil. It doesn't no. like compaction. It doesn't like having wet feet no. for most of the year, really. Um, so it, it does really sort of focus the mind on, on soil improvement and getting that filtration through the soil and opening that top, yeah. you know, three, four, five inches. I think one of the things up. on soil and sort of nutrients, I think one of the things I've seen a lot of this year is boron deficiency with stem splitting. And I think because we have, as an industry, we've gone to these a lot quicker. These quicker varieties, I think a beer on scorpion, if you're looking at the club root varieties, I think foliar boron this year has been a, would be a key inclusion early in the spraying programme, particularly before stem extension. So can I ask both yeah. yourself as a breeder and I have it as a lot of trial work, you know, what what work has been done on trace elements and everything because and biostimulants for that matter, it's, it's a huge field of um, product that's out there and there's loads of different opinions that come from well, obviously, the different people yeah. that's selling it, but other other bodies, some some will say, well, it's a waste of time. It's it's you know just muck, really. And it's not doing anything. And other people will swear by it. Yeah. We know? we actually are very linked to that, John. We've got a question from Jonathan here. A Lima Green undertaking sap testing in the spring to monitor yeah. plant health and yeah. nutrient balance. Mm -hmm. Because if we're going to get down to targeting nutrients and everything else, and, and we're going down that. You know, and as a lot of people are, that's going down that really uh, attention to detail road. That all comes into it, yep. you know. And if you you don't want to be missing some of the micronutrients when you're lashing loads of the the expensive stuff on. Yeah, I you go, uh, the, the the biostimulants is a it's a difficult <laughs> question. Um, there is a wide range of toys out there to play with. Um, um, more so in cereals, we are looking at, at biostimulants. Um, we're struggling to find ones that make that big difference. Um, but yes, we are trying to get more targeted with understanding the nutrition so that you can do things about it. But it's it's it, it, it's having um, one particular nutrient may actually upset the balance. It's it's not just a Oh, we short the boron. We need to put boron on it. Yeah. That will mix with the whole, you know. So yeah. it's, it's understanding soil is a really complicated thing. I think my career so far has been based with, with trials. Ulcerative rape trials are actually quite hard to do. So to They're do very hard to do. plot trials on ulcerative rape, looking at biostimulants wouldn't be nearly impossible because there's that many other variables to take into account in terms of yield. I think yeah. the best, if you're looking at biostimulants, I think the best thing to do is actually. Do tramline trials on your farm and see what works. Yeah, it's about, see what I mean, works for you. Yeah, it, it, you just take the time and you drop a couple of tramlines out. You yeah. try a bit of this, try a bit of that, and if you if you've got a yield meter on the combine, yeah. it gives you a guide. It's it's probably not scientific, no, but it's it's probably good enough for on farm use to satisfy someone's mind that either it's yeah it's worth paying for or yeah. it's not. And I think um, a, a couple of tramlines in a field and actually. Every farm is different. So if we do a trial here at Rothwell, mm -hmm. we've got completely we're on the we're on the walls. It's it's very, very different land compared to where yeah. you are, John, or where you are, Colin. So I think it's on farm trials for biostimulants are probably work out what works for you. I think I think it is, but it's the same with varieties. Yeah. You know, you you could put five different varieties on a farm and they'll all react differently yeah. in different parts of the country. So mm -hmm. it's great that the trial work's been done by all bodies, but sometimes you just got to do a bit of your own trial work, even if it's just in a, a rough sort of way to get a feel for what what works and what doesn't on your land in your microclimate. Yeah, I, I'd go into that as well. I think AHDB, I think they've got two, they've got three less of the UK, North, yeah. North and East West. They're huge areas. I think if you can go into further detail and 
they're probably not as good a shout about as, the, as they could be. But actually, if you go into the harvest results, you can see the results from the sites that are local yeah, to you. Right. Yeah. And if you go and look at those sites and see what works for you, mm -hmm. local to you, and I know you try a lot of different varieties on your farm. You have trials before you switch varieties. and Yeah, we want to, we want to try to same with the cereals as well. We'll try, you know, you look at the lists or you or you believe the, the 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 sort of sales pitches from the different breeders and you think well we'll give that a go so you might get half a bag or a ton of um half a ton or a ton of seed come out and you'll give it a go and see yeah. whether it works and some work really well and others don't and um yeah you wouldn't know unless you tried it yourself no exactly and local field days are brilliant you know, oh, yeah. there's there's a lot of establishments out there that can demonstrate varieties in your region and it's it's worth going and having a look because the difference you know from the from the, the southwest to scotland <clears> the, <throat> the white north wales it is but so is so some of the farm groups as well that you mm -hmm. get and, yeah. and to be fair the hdb yeah their model of farm true. system was pretty good on mm -hmm. that and they yeah. i think they're running that continually um so yeah there's a lot of information out there it's just a case of Find what suits you and sifting out the good stuff from the stuff that's not relevant. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, it's quite a lot of questions coming in, but we are um, very short to end. So I think we'll, we'll have two more questions uh, and then we'll wrap up. Um, one here, there's been a few along this, along a similar vein um, around um, spring growth and the ability to control um, larval damage. So question here from Tim and there were some others of like, similar, as I said, you know, many local crops have also looked good from the road. However, in the past, often those good looking crops have, have not yielded at the harvest time due to the larvae in the stems. Um, uh, there was actually a, a similar question. Um, does rapid spring growth have a benefit in coping with flea beetle? Um, growing away, from, are you growing away from the challenge? Is there any thoughts around kind of varietal differences or or strategies to help mitigate larval damage? Um, we haven't found any varieties that uh, we haven't proved that any varieties specifically are better. But that once once you've got you know if one's got ten larvae in it and another one's got ten, does one grow better than the other? We haven't found that yet. But um, I think a lot of this comes back to us understanding the life cycle better. Um, so we are, and, and DEFRA have actually stumped up some, some more money for us this year to widen the emergence trapping so that we can actually understand the pest better. Because once you've got all the larvae in the stem, there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, a rapid growing crop probably helps, if anything, pigeon wise because what we do see now is secondary grazing by pigeons where you've got the, the high stem larval numbers because the, the crops are a lot slower and then hence the pigeons have got somewhere to land. Um, so as I say, going back to it, understanding the life cycle better so that we, we can hopefully come up quickly with some ideas that will help reduce that larval burden in in whatever variety you're growing is the only way forward in my humble opinion um, because there there must be cultural things we can do from an IPM perspective if we can understand exactly what the numbers are when they're appearing out of the soil at what point and in which geographical location then we can start to plan strategies around it I think in terms of variety i'd agree i think if we stood here and say we've got a variety that's tolerant i think we'd be we'd all be doing backflips um it doesn't exist i think we've seen we've i've seen data for, that we've done with agri and actually aspire i would say has an ability as a variety has an ability to tolerate i think i've seen trials data where it was the the most badly affected in terms of flea beetle larvae but actually yielded the highest in that trial so Aspire is a very robust variety. It's a bit like the Black Knight off Black Adder. It no. hits off it and it just keeps coming back for another go. Um, but I think check what's actually causing the stem damage. I think people are drilling early. We're seeing a lot more winter rape stem weevil, mm -hmm. um, a lot of cabbage root fly, which is actually affecting the roots, which we're starting to see now in, in OC rape crops, particularly down south. Cabbage stem fleet, but it has always been blamed for these dying stems and you put it open and it's not a cabbage stem flea beetle larvae. So I think identifying the pest that you've got first and foremost, which larvae you've got, 
um, but building a bigger biomass. I mean, last year with those frosts we had in April, um, or the larvae were in the PT holes. So flea beetle can detect as a, a leaf is senescent and they will move into the leaf. Those frosts we had last year dropped the leaves straight off and the flea beetle dropped off with it. Also, you'd rate, well, flea beetle larvae and PT holes aren't a problem really because the plant can overcome those when they get to the stem. So the more leaf biomass you can get, keep them in the PT holes, the better really. Um, OK, well, I think uh, we just reached up, but I'll do one more very quick question and it'd be a miss for us not to discuss nitrogen, given the um, <laughs> it's a very hot topic this spring, of course. Um, got a question from Graham. There's another, some other questions come in around nitrogen use efficiency. This one in particular, if one GAI is equivalent to 50 kilos of nitrogen per hectare, have LG or NIAB trials cutting back spring nitrogen inputs or forward all seed rate crops with a GAI of two or three or even more? Yes. Um, so this work was done a long time ago uh, where basically square metres of crop were taken out and an analysis was carried out to find out exactly how much nitrogen was in them. And from that, we ended up with the 49.50 kilos um, for each GAI. So for every, um, so the green, the green area index, basically, if you've got a, a, a two metres square worth of leaves and stuff, in one square meter of soil, that that's a GAI of two. Um, yes, we would quite happily at that stage make a decision to reduce nitrogen. Uh, we've tended to to suggest that we don't go below 170, but certainly where you have a crop that looks like that, at that point in the spring, we are quite comfortable knocking the nitrogen back. I think nitrogen splitting is a big topic. I think actually if you can we're getting a lot more bigger hybrids. If you can reduce that first nitrogen split, actually what that does is it stops stem growth. And that's not what you want in a crop. If, so obviously put a bit of nitrogen on to, to get it up and away, but little and often, but feed the cat, feed the pod in and feed the branch in rather than feeding that stem growth. So from your opinions, what would be the latest you would go on with nitrogen? But how would you, how you know, timings wise, where would you place those splits if you were going on with say three or four splits? Most people will do what, two? Yeah, I guess. But if generally, you know, generally we, we do Valentine's three, Day and then a month later. Um, what will be the latest one, and what proportion of nitrogen out of whatever you're going to put on would you would you put in each split? I would get as much of your sulphur on as early as possible. Mm -hmm. I think that's. It, and what it, level of sulphur would you put on? Enough. No, <laughs> that, that's that's going to massively depend on where you live and yeah, you know, soil types. There's not as much sulphur coming down. There is I think a lot of I think looking through yen reports, actually a lot of the every nearly every yen report is low on sulphur. Yeah, sulphur is massively under applied to crops. I think it is on cereals. Yeah, well across the board actually. But mm -hmm. I I would say my main dressing for after stem extension. Right. And then I would even go up to podding. If, if you've got liquid fur, obviously it's quite hard to spread. It depends on what equipment you've got. If you've got a disc spinner, you can't spread into a, into a standing crop. So, but all the end reports that we've seen are little and often. Use it when nitrogen's expensive. Don't dump it on when the crop can't use it. No. Because it's just going to go in the air. Yeah, I think it's got to, well, we, we try. <laughs> Sometimes more successfully than others, just sort of put the thermometers in the ground and get your soil temperature, measure that. Yeah. And, you know, you want it to be sort of five plus, I would think, before you're thinking about putting nitrogen on because you can then get, I mean, this year has been a typical example. You know, it was OK. Then it, you got up to there and then, wow, we've had a really cold spell. Yeah. You know, it's back down. And dry. Yeah. 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 So, well, whenever that dry where we are, mate. No, I mean, it, it's, we, we've had negligible rain in April for two years on the trot. Yeah. Um, so it, it is a fine balance between getting it into a warm, moist soil it is, and then gambling that you wait and there's no rain. So it, it, is, it is a difficult yeah, yeah. one. Which I think foliar feeds come into that as well. Actually, yeah, that's what I would say. Get the, yeah. Get, yeah. And I think they come in when it's dr eaten more into the road on drier yeah. mm -hmm. springs. Mm -hmm. Guys, that was excellent. Well, we'll have to finish there for one slightly over. Um, so uh, all I to say is thank you very much, Colin, John, Liam. Um, thank you very much for everyone who's joined us. Um, another reminder, if you want the basis of Neuroso points, you will see uh, my colleague Ron has posted the link in the chat feature. Please just click on there, enter your details to get your basis Neuroso points. 
thanks again for joining. Um, we will send a recording of this um, uh, round if you did miss bits or joined a bit later. Um, and uh, yeah, we hope to see you soon in uh, in the summer. If you come to one of our demos, um, invites will be out shortly. Um, you can see some meet Liam in person, um, Ron, come around some of our trial sites. So um, thanks again. Uh, thanks everyone um, for your contributions. Really, really good discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.